In 1939, William T. Grant, who was a depression version of Sam Walton, um, ran millions of dollar stores across the United States, um, gave Harvard a grant because he was interested in making other people's lives happier. And the grant was to follow 268 um, men for a lifetime, but he only funded it for the first five years. And the idea was to study health and not sickness. And so in, to that extent, he anticipated Marty Seligman by um, 60 years. And the grant study since then has paid attention to how people grow up and what lies behind doing well. And Lonnie's already given away the punchline, which is it's got nothing to do <clears throat> with making money. It's got nothing to do with career success. It's got something to do with staying married for a long time. And it's got everything to do with taking love in. And when I say it's got something to do with staying married for a long time, let me reassure you that there's nothing wrong with divorce. That one quarter of 50-year marriages remain um, not very happy. And as my editor said, because I thought in my um, younger days that people that got divorced had some kind of character disorder, he said to me, George, it's not getting divorced that's bad. It's loving people for a long period of time that's good. So that there are a lot of divorced people in the world who at 80 have been happily married for um, several decades. The most important contribution of the um, grant study, besides playing into um, sentimental Lonnie and sentimental George with this love stuff, the most important contribution was improving the two greatest psychologists of the last 150 years wrong. Both Sigmund Freud and William James were convinced that people's personalities only developed for so long. For Freud, it was seven years. For William James, it was 30 years. But this was believed and proved and argued about in journals uh, for the whole 20th century. Uh, in the 21st century, nobody would agree with that. And one of the reasons I'm going to illustrate is just one of the stories from the grant study. But the problem with our whole view of how things work in the world is that we know that our hands don't move. I mean, you just have to look at them and you see that. And the problem is, if you follow people for five years, People who've gotten divorced are still having a lot of trouble. If you follow alcoholics for 20 years, nothing seems to stop their drinking. But if you follow people who are divorced, people who are alcoholic, the no-hopers for 
50 and 60 years, a great many of them recover. And I learned this when I was a resident, when I followed schizophrenics for 30 years, which was a harebrained scheme, but I managed to use earlier records to make my point, that if you follow schizophrenics, which is supposed to be a deteriorating disease, until they're 60, a lot of them are doing remarkably well. So, our brains are a unique organ. I mean, you're all sitting out there in your 40s and 50s scared stiff of growing old because you know since you've been 20 your whole body has been going south. <laughs> all right? You know, it doesn't get better after 21. Bruce Jenner should have stopped while he was ahead. <laughs> and um, yet the, and it's, it's true that after 30, you forget people's names. I've had to try to learn um, Leslie and Sharon's name over and over again by rehearsing it before I can keep them straight. Lonnie's a little bit easier. Um, that's true. But our brains, the part of us that makes us grown up, gets better and better with time. Now, obviously, at the end of life, bad things happen. Nobody's at their best, usually, on their deathbed. But if you can just think of the old people you know that are healthy, rather than the old people you know that are sick, you realize that as the brain develops, it becomes more empathic, more able to postpone gratification, and more patient. And if you study how people, well, Erickson provided the theory for this, so that all I'm doing is experimentally showing that Eric Erickson was right. But he said that at the end of adolescence, we finally develop an identity and manage to declare ourselves separate from our parents. And then our next task is to do that thing that every 23-year-old is terrified by my, you know, the source of real anxiety is when you ask him or her to move in with you and him or her says yes. And it's that sustained intimacy that makes marriage possible and work and is built into our systems as um, monogamous, although one of my uh, friends, um, judging from his own life, had to point out that we were seriously monogamous. Um, the next step is committing yourself to a career. And many of the grant study men were unhappiest in their um, early 30s when they'd had this smart-ass uh, Harvard education and were so um, well prepared for the world, but what should they do? And what should they do that would make them stand out from the rest of the pack? God help us. And so that picking a career instead of a job involves commitment, it involves contentment, it involves competence, and it involves compensation. 
You can't be a lepidopterist all your life. Even Lonnie confessed that this is the first year she's ever taken a salary. And a, fan. <laughs> a fan. Now, poor woman, she's had to eat for many years, but uh, she is now uh, properly uh, committed to fan as if you hadn't noticed for the last many years. Then, once you've become a success at your job, as one man put it, I learned to care more about the kids than I did about myself. So the reason that medical residents and people scrambling for partnerships in law firms are such royal, narcissistic pains in the tail is they're all trying to get to a safe place. And as soon as you get to a safe place, then your job is to give it away and become a mentor. And those of you that are senior law partners and full professors and captains of industry and you despair that your young managers are ever going to help mentor the next generation, relax. We all grow up. Some of us take a little longer than others. And after generativity, you become a keeper of the meaning. Put in very simple terms, the manager of the Cubs or the White Sox grows up to be commissioner of baseball where he has to treat everybody with an even hand. And at the end of life, you learn that your job, as one man put it, is to show your children how to die. Take what responsibility for yourself you can and be graceful that the death rate remains one per person. It's not the end of the world. It's going to happen. But you don't have to worry about it until you're there. Okay, let me tell you a story. And by the way, my, um, this talk about growing old, it's easy for me to say at 80, but when I was 57, just like Ezekiel Emanuel at 57, I was scared stiff of growing old, and he wrote for the Atlantic, some of you may have read, Why I Want to Die at 75. That's total undulterated horseshit. But the reason why I know it and he doesn't is that I'm 27 years his senior. Okay. I wasn't, I was just like him when I was that age. I want to tell you about Pierre Camille. He was a train wreck when he was young and at 75, he became, for the first time in his life, a man, or in his words, joyful, connected, and effective. He presented himself to the ground study as a tall, red-headed lad who wanted to be a doctor and help other people. But he hadn't been at the ground study long when they realized he was a flaming hypochondriac, which in modern psychiatric language is borderline, or in the words of the uh, very kindly health service director, a regular psychoneurotic. After he'd spent 10 years in the grant study, he was given an E in prognosis for future personality um, stability, and they believed that he was um, unfit 
for the practice of medicine. He got into medical school and on graduation attempted suicide because he was terrified of taking care of dependent people. Now, to be a hypochondriac, to be a help-rejecting complainer, to attempt or even commit suicide is one of the most aggressive, hostile things a person can do, only it seems passive and that they're the only victim. Now these things are done unconsciously. We can't blame people for them. To be a hypochondriac gets Pierre Camille, who as he said, father didn't exactly make up for mother's shortcomings, and 20 years later confirmed the statement with an either liked nor respected my parents, and a child psychiatrist observing the record confirmed it. It was a way of trying to get care in a manipulative way that only drove people away. Suicide not only makes people devastatedly sad, but it makes them angry at the hostility. These are not good unconscious ways and yet we do them because they're effective coping. Camille's parents were paranoid and it makes everybody feel better if it's your fault and not mine. You have that terrible habit of scratching your head. You know, I mean, these adaptive mechanisms are coping, but they're terrible. And as you follow people over time, they mature. And just a take-home example is Beethoven, who as a young man wrote in his diary, if I become completely deaf, I will kill myself. So in midlife, he became completely deaf. And all he did was take Schiller's Ode to Joy, put it to music in the Ninth Symphony, and it's been platinum for 200 years. Now that's coping. But you can't do it on purpose. Humor is a wonderful coping device. Coping manages to bring the unbearable into consciousness and get a laugh out of it. But try to be funny on purpose. You know, it's just a gift of God, and as the men grew older, they grew better at it. Camille, in about 30, went to a psychiatrist and discovered that his hypochondriasis was that he was paying for a healthy ambition with depression. And so he replaced his hypochondriasis with displacement. A level of neurotic defenses like repression, forgetting dentist appointments, isolation, what surgeons do, not to mind cutting their best friend up from guggle to satch. Um, they're everyday defenses, we all use them. And he used displacement instead of hypochondriasis. So he sent the um, study his sister's autopsy report and said, I think this may be an item of interest. He was fond of the sister. 
He sent, he told the study that he'd received an inheritance from his mother. Now, folks, there's only one way you can receive an inheritance. But he didn't mention the feelings attached to it. But displacement is a much more empathic coping style than passive aggression or help projecting and complaining. You know, it, so his sister died, so his mother died, no one else had to worry. Unlike many adolescents, Camille, until he was 30, had been unaware of the connections between his body and his feelings. After he was 30 or 35, emotional stress, instead of making him feel ill and rush to the infirmary, he realized that his indigestion and abdominal pains simply meant he was upset or outraged. Then at 35, he had a life-changing experience. He was hospitalized with pulmonary tuberculosis for 14 months, and 10 years later, he recalled his first thought on being admitted as it's neat I can go to bed for a year and get away with it. Now, for most of you in this audience, at 30, as you were starting to consolidate careers, being hospitalized for a year would have been a disaster. But for Camille, it was pure joy. As he put it, somebody with a big S cared about it. <laughs> Nothing has been so tough since that year in the sand. And so, like Beethoven, he was able to spin dung into gold. Beethoven did it into platinum, but then we're not all Beethoven. Um, and that transformative year led to a um, developmental explosion. He got himself married. He became committed to um, his career and became a competent doctor and generative. And unlike some doctors, he became a really good dad. Now, altruism is giving unto others what you wished you'd had. And I've mentioned sublimation I've mentioned humor, I've mentioned altruism, I'll mention um, suppression, which is Angela Duckworth's grit. That, by the way, goes up absolutely linearly from 18 to 65. Our brains get better with time. Hard to believe. One of um, Camille's daughters, aged now 50, told me that both his children considered him to be an exemplary father. And so both the hospitalization and his children allowed him to build for himself the loving surround that he'd so missed as a child and allowed development to take place. And as I've said, his displacement was replaced with altruism. At 30, he'd hated his dependent patients in spite of his adolescent Fantasy, that's another immature defense. That's making an imaginary world in your head that's better than the one outside. And he now said what he liked most about medicine was that I had problems and went to others 
and now I enjoy others coming to me. When I was 55 and Camille was 70, I asked him my routine retirement question. Those of you 65 and older can ask yourselves the question. What have you learned from your children? Some people just answered all the good things their children had learned from them. Adult development doesn't happen to everybody at the same time. Camille was thoughtful. He said, that's a tough question. Isn't that a whopper? And I'd hope that this sensitive young, not young anymore, at 70 septuagenarian, was going to give me a more profound response. But two days later, I was giving a talk to his reunion class, and he came running up to me, his eyes full of tears. And he said, George, you know what I learned from my children? I learned love. When I first wrote about the life of Godfrey Camille, I had no idea what led to his recovery. Clearly, it was catalyzed by his year of enforced invalidism. That was life-changing for Eugene O'Neill, who'd also grown up with a loveless childhood. At age 55, he told me he attributed everything to a visit from Jesus in his VA hospital. I was 40 and somewhat younger in terms of spiritual path, and I thought it was due to all the kind, sustained nursing care, mothering he'd gotten for a year. But neither explanation's completely satisfactory. What I know now is it doesn't really matter. It took me years to take love seriously and appreciate that both answers are partly right. What does love look like? A vision of Jesus? A kind nurse? A loving daughter? Love's different for everybody. But as Lonnie says, and you listen to Lonnie, Take it in. At age 75, he described in greater detail how love had healed him. He wrote in his 50th reunion yearbook the following. Before there were dysfunctional families, I came from one. The truly gratifying unfolding has been into the person I've gradually become comfortable, joyful, connected, effective. That children's classic, The Velveteen Rabbit, tells how connectedness is something we must let happen to us. And then we become solid and whole. As the tale recounts tenderly, only love can make a toy bunny real. Denied this in boyhood for reasons I now understand. It took me years to tap substitute sources. What seems marvelous is how many there are and how restorative they prove. And so that after that, Camille entered the next developmental stage, which is to become a guardian or a keeper of the meaning, commissioner of baseball rather than the feistiest manager in town. And like other old people, Camille became interested in genealogy recovering the past for the present. But he pursued it by finding 
the relatives in his family tree that were still alive and living in Germany. He went to Germany, befriended them, and so at the end of the, his life, he had the family he never had. He also became a guardian at his church. When he was 80, he gave himself a potluck supper. 300 people came and he provided the jazz band. And when he died, suddenly at 82, of a heart attack while playing squash with people 30 years his junior. He had a huge memorial service. The bishop's eulogy was, there was a deep and holy authenticity about the man. His son's tribute was dad, lived a very simple life but it was very rich in relationships. And yet prior to age 30, Camille had no relationships and was a train wreck. Folks change, the defense rests. Thank you. I just told Lonnie I did what I was told and she said, no, I didn't. George told me that he, hello? Okay, good. George told me uh, yesterday that he's a good boy who does what women tell him to do. Well, I'm in the presence of a force of nature, you bet. <laughs> Thank you. I've grown pretty attached to George over the months that we've been communicating by email and phone, perhaps in his presentation tonight, you have a small sense as to why. I would tell the fan board and the liaisons when I would meet with them and talk about updates about the upcoming program, and I would say that whenever I talked to George, that there was such a, uh, a man who was in, at 80 was so open, and all he would do on the phone is laugh. He laughed at every single thing I said. He was just so uh, settled and aware and kind. It was a remarkable experience for me. Uh, and I just felt so strongly about both the contents of Triumphs of Experience, which I encourage you, I, I think you all know if you've been here to programs, I don't shill books for my speakers. I don't say, go buy the book. Not, not really. The book is just beautiful. There is so much in there that you've gotten only just the tip of the iceberg right now. It's so incredible, so much rich data about what leads to flourishing for men across the lifespan. So I wanted to take this opportunity a little bit different than what we did last night in Glenbrook, and what I want to do is talk to George about a couple of things that would be particularly pertinent to our audience roughly people 35 to 65, uh, parents, many of you, not everyone, but many of you parents, and looking at some of, pull out some of the statistics, pull out some of the pieces that are gonna be of particular interest. So by way of a short preamble, uh, you started with the grant study in 1966 when you were 32. You had been looking at recovery from heroin addiction prior to that, if I'm correct, and you were interested particularly in coping mechanisms. You were looking at coping mechanisms and how they allow people to evolve uh, over time and adapt incrementally to life's adversity. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about when you first started, what were your thoughts and thinking about the, the grant study? It was still pretty new, at 60, well, it's in 1966 well, actually. Well, I mean, when I, I came to, after getting through my residency, I, I wanted to study, um, people who'd had schizophrenic breakdowns in college and had come back to their 20th reunion and they said, boy, in 1940, we didn't have a psychiatric health service at Harvard, but we have this thing called the Grant Study. That was studying normal men 
And I thought to my God, uh, it will be a 25-year follow-up, but how boring. <laughs> and, uh, you know, after one week, I was into Agatha Christie uh, detective novel and remained there ever since. Uh, my father was an archaeologist, and I'd never shown much interest in that for the usual Freudian competitive reasons. And when I found myself digging through an old uh, files that were now getting on to 50 years old, I thought to myself, Jesus, George, you've turned into a goddamned archaeologist. <laughs> but it was fascination. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the study, t just some of the nuts and bolts of it, so how often would they serve, there were 268 Harvard men, a couple other studies were joined down the line to it, but the, the core group at the beginning. One group was long-term follow-up of women, just in defense of the fact that at six I was a male chauvinist, and I probably still am, but I've tried to improve with development. What, how often were the men surveyed? Uh, and how often, I know they had physical exams, they had, uh, to the most part, in-person interviews as what, well. What, what makes often? the grant study unique is that there's been physical, psychological studies, I mean, physical studies like the Framingham study, and there have been um, psychological studies like the Birkeland Growth Study and the Terman Study. What made the grant study unique is that every two years, the men were asked a long series of personal questions, including, um, do you believe in the afterlife? And um, every five years, they were given a complete physical exam. So that we had these two strands of development going side by side. And about every 15 years, they were personally interviewed, and that was by far the most rewarding part of it, because I would go in and meet these men that were much more distinguished than I was. They were 15 years older than I was, and I, sort of like I want to call Denise, sir, <laughs> I always feel that way about headmistresses and headmasters. And, uh, Instead, to them, I was the university physician. And it was, they were small boys being examined, but the really important bond was because I knew so much about them. For 25, for 35, for 50 years, they saw me as an old friend. Here was someone who knew their past pains and war stories, and so that I got the sense of every interview that I was having an intimate conversation with an old friend, and as I'm sort of a loner, this was just a tremendous treat. So, I mean, it's been nothing but joy from beginning to end. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the highlights of what came out of that that will be of particular interest. So let's first talk about childhood environments and the warmth of relationships with mothers in particular. Uh, some of the statistics is that uh, the income of men who have warm relationships with their mother is significantly larger than men well, who well, do not. This was this was interesting. I mean, I'm a card-carrying psychoanalyst. I, I went through the whole schmear of a psychoanalytic institute in Boston, which is pretty conservative. And uh, I assumed that these men's relationships with their mothers was going to be important. And for the first 25 years of the study, it wasn't. Was not. I mean, that was one of the findings, was that mothers, whether they loved you or not, didn't make much difference. And when it did start to make a difference, it was that the men who had close relationships 
with their mothers had higher IQs. They were more successful at work. They made more money and something that needs to be replicated before you believe it, uh, they were less likely to develop uh, Alzheimer's. Their, their cognitive function was preserved. Whereas their dads were the ones that taught them how to play and a good relationship with your father meant that you'd have a better relationship with your wife. And this isn't in the books, and I certainly didn't expect it. And then when you put it together, and this is Lonnie's world rule that she's sending you home with is metabolize love. The um, Grant Study's first experiment was, was World War II. All of the men were about to be drafted, went from peacetime in 39 to everyone in the armed forces by 44. And they were trying to figure out who would make a good officer. And with the chauvinism of the day, they predicted masculine body build, how much grit you had on the treadmill, were you on the football team, were you high social class, did you have high grade point average, were you smart? And they checked out with the officer of candidacy school. I'm sorry. Uh, did you hear all of that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I just felt so. Um, they um, found that it matched, so they didn't bother to complete the experiment. They agreed with the Army. Why do science? And here's where the advantage of having a telescope comes. I, in probably 2011, looked at what made a good officer. And here was a beautiful cohort of 268 men who had a lovely bell curve of promotion from private first class for four years to getting to be a major by the end. Here was a test of leadership. What did it correlate with? Nothing that OCS thought was important, but it definitely correlated with warmth of childhood. That means being close to both mother, father, and hopefully a sibling. In other words, to be a good platoon leader, you've got to love your men, and they in turn will love you, and Marty Seligman's group at West Point has found this stuff. You know, rock stars don't have this problem. <laughs> okay. Next question. <laughs> Next question. One other point about uh, warm relationships with fathers. You also noted that they, the men who have a warm relationship with their father, they have lower rates of adult anxiety as well. Do you have any thoughts about that? They're just more settled? Or not. Look, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, what's going through my mind is every child is scared of ogres and uh, giants and things that go bump in the night. And that's what causes our anxiety, is what might be hiding under the bed. And if your father is gentle and generally kind, then uh, that anxiety goes down. 
the flip side of the coin of all of that positive adult development and warmth in childhood, the flip side is that you found that there was uh, one major factor that really led to early mortality and morbidity, um, destruction really in a man's life. And if we can now turn to what is one of your main research focuses, separate from the grant study, but if we want to talk about alcoholism and alcohol use. This is how you get the taxpayers to pay for a study of fancy schmancy Harvard men's development is you tell the National Institute on Alcoholism that you've got a group of deprived inner city men and a group of upper middle class men and you really care about alcoholism because you're working in an alcohol clinic and while you've been there, they've made you go to 100 AA meetings over 10 years, uh, kicking and screaming. You did that? I did that. Wow. That's why I was class A trustee. I see. Uh, and um, you learn something about alcoholism. And the first thing you learn about alcoholism is that probably nobody in this room realizes just how pervasive and important it is. As good Nutrier high school parents, you're horrified by your children's binge drinking. And what's different about your child's adolescent drinking is it's just as scary, they're just as likely to be killed in a car wreck, but when they vomit, on Denise's front doorstep. They did it on purpose and they're glad. Whereas when Teddy Kennedy at 50 lost his pants in front of the New York Times and Patrick, he was devastated. So that the definition of alcoholism isn't how much you drink or how often you drink. That simply doesn't correlate because nobody, if you if I asked the population of Illinois how much they drank, I could only account for 40% of package store sales, which means there's a terrible breakage problem between the bottle shop and the home. To, to make the diagnosis of alcoholism, sort of the simplest question is, um, does it put you in control or out of control? For my research purposes, it was how many DWIs, how often does your wife complain, how often does your children complain, how often does your boss complain, and you add those up into numbers and they predict very well, thank you. For an audience like this, who still believes the religion is good for your health studies because when you do a study of religion is good for your health, you look at Mormons and Southern Baptists and compare them to the people that aren't and the people that aren't drink a whole lot more. Where in the Harvard study, I compared Episcopalians, um, do you know how many Episcopalians it takes to change a light bulb? Two. One to mix the martinis and one to change the light bulb. Uh, to call the, I'm sorry, to call the electrician. And uh, the others were Irish Catholics who are not known for their um, sobriety. So for the grant study, uh, how often you went to church and how big a drinking you problem had, had you had properly measured, not by the way most studies do, by quantity, frequency, but by the problem drinking. But just for yourselves and your friends, and if you like your um, new Trier High School students, there's an acronym called the CAGE. And the CAGE is, have you ever cut down? That's the C. Cut That's down. the C. Good for you. And two, are you annoyed when people talk about your 
drinking, meaning your peers, not your parents. The G is do you sometimes feel guilty? Teddy Kenny felt guilty, the high school college student who vomits on the president's front doorstep, boasts to all his friends in the fraternity the next day. And E is eye-opener, and because women deal with alcohol a little bit differently, one is um, Well, I won't go there. Um, there's um, sometimes used uh, I don't know why it's the T, but can you oh, two. When you have two drinks, do you not feel high? For women. For women. And, and that means that uh, You've, you've built up a dependency to it, and that's, uh, in terms of general risk, what doesn't cause alcoholism is depression or unhappy childhoods. What does cause alcoholism is genes, and the problem is, if your parents were alcoholic, they probably were lousy parents and you didn't have a happy childhood. So the people, especially in the 50s and 60s where the idea of genetics meant you were a Nazi, uh, they just assumed that this was related to poor childhood environment. I, half my subjects were inner city men who were chosen as controls for delinquency because of their, uh, the fact that they were highly deprived and hadn't become delinquent. And um, it's no different for them. Um, the um, extraordinary statistic, which to me was probably the most surprising uh, number, was that 57% of grant study divorces had an alcoholic member. And the reason that none of the marriage books know this is a good gentleman uh, usually doesn't call himself a lush, and he certainly doesn't call his wife a lush. She's depressed, she's a borderline, She's manic depressive. Now, it's very simple. If you send the person to AA, and that, in a 60-year follow-up, is much the best treatment for alcoholism, it really works. But you have to keep on coming back. Um, it's kind of like you can only get a high school education by, Nutria takes four years. They can't give you a smart pill and a coaching session and, and send you out. So George, it's kind of interesting because the alcohol use, I mean, thinking contemporary teenagers, young adults, it's interesting that I wonder how many, how much, even back for older generations, that the depression or the various neurotic symptoms were the things being treated without understanding that, that it was the alcohol that's causing as opposed to the flip. And if, you, and if you don't it's, treat, it's, and if you don't treat the alcohol it's, it's piece, what, you're not going to gain traction. It's, it's what, uh, got a very good point, that we all, as good psychiatrists, the story I told yesterday was a man who was hospitalized for eight months at a time repeatedly over 20 years, and no one ever made the diagnosis of alcoholism. And as soon as he was uh, free, previously while drinking, he'd been selling Harvard University books to pay for his um, bets at the racetrack. And um, 
when he'd been sober in AA for two years, he was consultant to the governor on gambling. Now these are both indulgent in a passion for gambling and odds, but one uh, pays much better than wagering on the ponies. Sublimation, mature defense.